All right, let's flip the screen. Oh, and that just lights my face perfectly. Look at that, and the autofocus on my face as well. It's tracking my eyes, that's insane. I can see my composition, I can see my audio levels. <laughs> oh, this is the perfect astro vlogging camera already. 51,200, 102,400, 204,800. 409,600. The A7S II is a camera that literally changed the course of my life for the past three or four years. It's the camera that allowed me to start the Astro Vlogs on my YouTube channel where you could actually see me in the dark environment working under the stars. And it was from YouTube that I started to get more interest in my workshops and that enabled me to leave my engineering career behind and go full time as a photographer. It was also from YouTube that I started working with the BBC, providing night sky footage and time lapses for various documentaries, and even co-producing my own documentary, Moonshot, which you can watch a 10 minute segment of on my YouTube channel. And even recently during the COVID-19 pandemic where all of my workshops were canceled, all of my public speaking events were canceled, all of my freelance work was getting canceled and postponed, I turned to my YouTube channel. And although I don't make a great deal of money from YouTube, it was enough to keep me going. And I can't talk about surviving the pandemic without mentioning and thanking all of my supporters over on Patreon because I really wouldn't have made it through without those guys. But my YouTube channel comes from this camera. So to say I'm excited about the A7S III is a little bit of an understatement. But there are some things I'd like to see improved from the A7S II in the A7S III. One of those is the battery life. The battery life of this thing sucks. I carry six, seven, sometimes eight batteries on a shoot and they run out so quickly. But that's definitely been fixed with the A7S III and the new Z-type batteries. I don't think I've gone through a night and even finished one battery yet. I'm, I just haven't worried about the battery life at all. It's really, really impressive. The other issue I had with this camera is that the buttons are very small and fiddly, not laid out very well. The dials are very sensitive, so as you're turning them, you sometimes accidentally press the buttons. But that's definitely been fixed with the A7S III. The buttons are bigger and chunkier. They're in more logical places. The dials are chunkier and are a lot more easier to use. So using the camera, the A7S III is just much more of a joy. And another thing I'd like to see improves on the A7S III is of course the noise performance. I'd like to see slightly better noise performance, especially at higher ISOs and especially with the new backlit sensor. But there's one big issue with the A7S II, and that is that when you do go to high ISOs, there's a horrible amp glow on the left hand side of the frame at the bottom of the frame and it just ruins the footage it's so distracting and it's very difficult to deal with in post-production so i really hope that that's solved and there's only one way to find out and that's to crank the iso on the a7s3 and find out so this footage was taken with the a7s3 the 24 millimeter g master at f 1.4 1 over 25 iso 51200 and the footage is looking great even at 64,000. Still looking pretty great, albeit a bit dark, but that's to be expected as there's no moonlight and pretty much no light pollution. At 80,000 is a little bit more noise visible now in the sky, but still no sign of that amp glow. And then at 102,400, the sky is a lot brighter, the horizon's a lot clearer, but there is definitely a little bit more noise now. Still no sign of amp glow. 128,000, there's a bit of a significant jump in the amount of visible noise, especially in the sky. Pushing higher to 160,000, a little bit more noise. Still no sign of the amp glow, but there's definitely a bit more noise visible in the area where the amp glow is to be expected. So maybe Sony has got some in-camera noise reduction going on, or maybe they're just processing the footage in a way that the amp glow doesn't stand out. 256,000, now the footage is starting to fall apart. There's a little bit of a magenta cast coming in from the right edge. 320,000 and again the noise is becoming very visible now and there's some magenta blotches on the right hand side and the upper left hand side 409,600 again the noise is way more visible now the footage is starting to fall apart and there's definite signs of noise reduction going on Compare that to the A7S II at 51,200 the footage looks good but you can already see 
the amp glow on the left hand side 64,000 footage is still looking reasonably good but again that amp glow is growing already at 80,000 the amp glow is a lot more prominent now and it's very distracting there's a bit of a magenta cast to the entire footage and at 102,400 that magenta cast really starts to take over the colors are falling apart the amp glow is very strong the noise is quite visible at 204,800, the footage has really fallen apart. There's a lot of noise. The amp glow is huge. There's a magenta cast across the whole image. 320,000, again, just magenta blotches everywhere. The top edge of the frame now really starting to bleed. 409,600, and it's just awful. Too much noise, lots of magenta casts, and amp glow on the upper, lower, and left-hand side of the edge. But compare that to the A7S III, there's less noise, the colour science just holds together a lot better. And it's far more usable, obviously it's not going to be used in a professional production, but for using it on YouTube, just to get your story across in some context, it's definitely a lot more useful. That said, I'm probably not going to find myself going over 102,400. That's pretty adequate for what I do. And going up a third of a stop to 128,000 is a significant increase in noise. But when there's a bit of light pollution or moonlight, I can obviously use lower ISOs. Now, this footage of a quarter moon setting is straight out of camera, no editing, and it is just stunning. There is a little bit of noise, but that would clean up so easily in post-production. And the same goes for 102,400, a little bit more noise, but that would clean up very easily in post-production. At 204,800, there's a lot more noise. You can start to see noise reduction artifacts now, and same with 409,600. So if I zoom into the left-hand side of the edge, you can see a lot more noise. You can also see some black blodges, which are noise reduction artifacts. Now sadly there's no way to turn off this in-camera noise reduction in the menu. The only way you can achieve it is to record raw footage using an external recorder like the Atmos Ninja 5, which is not something I'm going to find myself doing anytime soon. But the A7S III does have dual gain ISO, so once you hit a certain ISO, the camera has a secondary gain circuit to boost the image brightness based on your ISO setting, and that secondary gain circuit is much better suited for low light videography. So this footage recorded in S-Log3 at ISO 10,000, you can see is very noisy, but then when I switch the ISO to 12,800, it immediately cleans up and looks way better. And that's because the camera is switching to that secondary ISO gain circuit, which is a lot better suited to low light videography. So if I zoom in 200%, so you can see it a little bit better. Starting at 10,000, you can see a lot of noise. And then switching to 12,800, you can see that it immediately cleans up and looks a lot better. And whilst the secondary gain ISO kicks in at 12,800 for S-Log2 and S-Log3, it actually changes depending on what picture profile you're using. Now at this point, I quickly need to mention Sony's picture profiles, which allow you to record footage with different gamma curves. So there are profiles like S-Log3, S-Log2, Cine 1, 2, 3, and 4, HLG, Movie. They all have a different look and they all have their different uses and advantages. So S-Log3 has a much bigger dynamic range than the other profiles. The Cine profiles are much easier to grade in post-production and if I show you some footage you will see that some appear brighter than others and some appear to have more noise than others. Now I won't go through all the picture profiles but this one here is movie and then this is Cine 1 which looks a lot noisier. Cine 2 has a really bad red overcast. Cine 3 is looking a lot better, the colours are a lot better, the footage is cleaner. Cine 4 similar but softer blacks. S-Log2 looks a lot darker, but the footage looks nice and clean. And then S-Log3 seems to be lifting the shadows quite heavily and unveiling a lot of noise. Now, the picture profiles don't actually result in more noise, and they're not actually brighter than the other. Even though I recorded all of them at 409,600 ISO, and some are brighter than the others, it's actually because each picture profile has a different base ISO from the dual gain ISO. So 409,600 ISO is not the same on S-Log3 as it is with Cine 4. I won't go into the technical details because I, I know not a lot of you will be interested, but if you are interested, go and check out Gerald Undone's very technically in-depth videos about this issue. And I mentioned that even though some look more noisy than others, this is not actually true. Some are lifting more detail out of the shadows so you can see more of the noise. 
But if you actually grade the footage in post-production and make the contrast equal, you'll see that they have the same amount of noise. Now, I briefly mentioned the dual gain ISO. Sony sensors have two different ISO amplifiers. So when you hit a certain point, uh, a separate amplifier kicks in and the footage looks a lot cleaner in low light. And these are the base ISOs for the second ISO gain amplifier. So each profile has a different second base ISO and it's basically 4.3 stops above the first base ISO. So each of the profiles have a different base ISO and a different second base ISO. But having different base ISOs mean that at 409,600, which is the limit ISO for all of the picture profiles, some of them are brighter than others. So at S-Log2, which has a very high second base ISO, you can't push that high past the second base ISO. Cine 4 has a much lower second base ISO. So by the time you get to 409,600, you're more stops above the second base ISO and you get brighter footage. But long story short, they all have the same amount of noise and when you grade them, they look pretty similar in the end anyway. Now, when you don't have any moonlight in your image or any light pollution and it's very dark and you can barely see what's on the screen at 400,000 even, the Sony Alpha cameras have a trick up their sleeve and that is a one over four second shutter speed. So even though you're recording in one over 25 frames per second, you can record with a one over four second shutter speed. This obviously results in a bit of motion blur. It almost looks like stop motion, even though one second of footage is one second of real life. But you can speed the footage up by 600% and get a pretty smooth looking time lapse, which can be useful. And another good use is when there's not much motion in your scene. So this landscape scene was shot at 409,000 ISO, was as high as I can go. But if I drop the shutter speed to one over four seconds, I can lower the ISO. The footage is a lot cleaner and you can now see the landscape a lot better. You can see the mountains, the sea, the sky. And because there's no motion, you can't really notice the slow shutter speed. It's also good for revealing faint objects. Like here, you can see a faint strip of the Milky Way and the Andromeda galaxy. But do note, if there's a meteor or a shooting star, it's going to look a bit weird with that motion blur. And here's another faint section of the Milky Way running through the Winter Circle. You see Pleiades in the upper right hand corner. And it's good for longer focal lengths as well. So this is the Andromeda Galaxy at 1 over 25 seconds. And then switching to 1 over 4, you can see a lot more detail in the faint spiral shape of Andromeda. And similarly with Orion, so again, this is 1 over 25 seconds. But then switching to 1 over 4 seconds, you get a lot more detail in the Orion Nebula. It's even blown out the highlights a little bit. And you can just about make out the Flame and Horsehead Nebula as well. Now you can also shoot high frames per second footage with the A7S III. With the right memory cards, you can shoot 4K at 120 and 1080 at 240. My SD cards only allow for 120 in 1080, which is what you're looking at right now. And of course, to shoot at these high frame rates, you need to use a shutter speed of at least 1 over 120. So this is where the low light capability really helps out. And although I don't think I'll find myself using it much, I have been using it recently to film some storms. And the results have been pretty good. Now, one thing to note with the Sony cameras is that the focus magnifier only zooms to four times. So if you're hard of sight, you may struggle to focus on the stars. It may sound a bit weird that there's only four times zoom, but when you consider that it's only a 12 megapixel sensor, you're still zooming in quite a bit on the image. Most other cameras have 10 times. Canon EOS RE has 30 times, for example. But for most cases, four times is fine. Although Richard Tatty from Nightscape Images did get in touch and say he was a little bit disappointed at this because he couldn't quite see the stars in good detail because he's hard of sight and found it difficult to focus. So this may be a consideration for you. But this is kind of made up for with the excellent EVF. So the electronic viewfinder on the A7S III is the highest resolution electronic viewfinder on the market right now with 9.44 million dots, if that means anything to you. It feels really big when you're looking through the viewfinder and it's highly detailed, it looks amazing, especially when you're previewing your recorded footage or your recorded images. The electronic viewfinder has a angle of view of 41 degrees, so it's really big when you're looking through the viewfinder, but you can shrink that down to 35. So if you're wearing glasses and you can't get as close to the viewfinder um, as somebody without glasses, it shrinks the screen so that you can still see the whole screen when you're looking at the viewfinder with glasses, which I thought was a pretty neat feature. Now, 
it pains me to say this again, but we have to talk about a star eater issue. For those of you that don't know, early Sony cameras were plagued with an issue dubbed the star eater, where the in-camera noise reduction would consider stars as noise and remove them from the image, even the raw files. There were ways to circumvent this and it was later fixed with a firmware update, but this time around, it's now in video. It's best to demonstrate this by focusing in and out slightly from infinity. And you'll notice that when the focus is perfect, some of those stars definitely disappear. The effect is stronger with ultra wide lenses where the stars are rendered small in the frame. And here I've shot with a 20 millimeter Sony lens. So the stars are very small in the frame and it's a very sharp lens. So when you do get perfect focus, the stars only rendered as one or two pixels. The in-camera noise reduction considers them hot pixels or stuck pixels and seems to be removing them. If I zoom into 200%, you can see this a lot better as well. A lot of the smaller stars are definitely disappearing. It doesn't happen so much with lenses that are not as sharp, and it doesn't happen so much with lenses of a longer focal length. So here with a 55mm, you can definitely see that it's still happening, but not quite as much as with a 20mm, and that's probably because the stars are being rendered bigger in the frame. Now, how much does this bother me? At the moment, not a lot, because it only affects wide angle lenses that are very sharp. And if I want more stars in the frame, I can just defocus slightly and the image quality is still great. If I don't want that many stars in the image, I can focus perfectly. And that will be good for making bright constellations stand out more in the footage, for example. That said, I would still love Sony to put an option in the menu to turn off the in-camera noise reduction. When it comes to vlogging with this camera, there is so much to love about it. So I've already demonstrated how the flippy screen can illuminate my face, but it also means I can check my audio levels, I can check the composition, and I can also check my focus, which is awesome because with the A7S II, I used to place the camera on my knee and then focus on the floor as that was roughly the distance between my outstretched arm and my face. But even then, I'd forget to do that so many times and my footage would just be out of focus. There's also been a new addition to the in-camera stabilization. So here is some footage without any stabilization. You can see a lot of shaking and micro jitters. But this is with the Sony Steady Shot, which we've seen on all of the Sony Alpha cameras now. And it does a good job of removing some of the micro jitters, and it does this by moving the sensor so there's no crop. They've now added a active stabilization mode, which does crop in by 10%, but it does a much better job of smoothening out the footage and micro jitters, and almost looks like it's come from a gimbal. And just to demonstrate that 10% crop, here's a handheld shot as I turn the stabilization on and off and you can see how much of the frame is being cropped it's also really useful for doing handheld panning moves they just look really smooth now and with a steady hand they almost look as if they've come from a gimbal now at first i wasn't very excited about the active stabilization because of the 10 percent crop i thought that cropping in the noise would be worse and i usually vlog with a 24 millimeter lens so that 10 percent sounded quite significant but it's actually not that bad and the footage looks way better it saves me from doing walk stabilization in post so i think i'll be using it quite a lot i just need to remember to turn it off when i don't need it because sometimes that extra 10 percent is important another great feature of this camera is that the microphone port has its own little door now so you can plug that in and it doesn't get in the way of the flippy screen Another new feature compared to the A7S II is that when you record video in portrait mode, it saves in portrait orientation as well. So if you upload into Instagram stories or Snapchat or Twitter stories now, the footage is already in vertical orientation and ready to upload. You can also transfer files very quickly from the camera to your smartphone as well. So as long as your smartphone has NFC, which most smartphones do, you just tap your phone to the side of the camera where the NFC marker is and it will bring up the Sony imaging software. It will connect to the camera's Wi-Fi and then transfer the file over. I sent a 330 megabyte video in about 20 to 30 seconds. So you can record a vertical video, transfer it over to your phone quickly and share that to Instagram or whatever from the field. And one last thing I wanna mention before I go into my summary is that finally Sony has made it so that when you switch between photo and video mode, the settings stay separate. So if, for example, I'm videoing at 1 over 25, f1.4, ISO 51200, Cine 4 picture profile, 
and then I switched to photo on the a7s2 all of those settings stay the same and those settings are useless for photography on the a7s2 when you switch to photo mode your previous photo settings are still there and they take it one step further you can actually go into the menu and choose which settings you want to stay when you switch between modes and which settings you want to stay separate as you switch between the modes so this is finally here in sony cameras and i hope they do it to the rest of sony cameras in a firmware update as well and i think that's all i really need to cover as an astronomer and as an astro vlogger and a extreme low light videographer so if you have any questions do let me know in the comments down below there are so many things i love about this camera and i'm so glad sony waited the five years to release it and it really feels like they've listened to the user's feedback the new menu system is amazing especially with the new touchscreen capabilities the articulating screen is awesome the new buttons the new dials the new battery microphone ports separate little door is amazing the one thing that i would like to see changed which i hope sony do in an upcoming firmware update is to be able to turn off the in-camera noise reduction so that i can do my own noise reduction in post-production and it will also solve that star eater issue as well however it's not enough to taint my love for this camera it's an absolute beast and it just feels ready for whatever i'm going to throw at it the high iso footage holds up a lot better than the a7s2 that amp glow is gone and quite importantly the color science is amazing you don't get that magenta cast it just looks great yes it's still noisy as hell but you get the context and you can see me working under the stars and i've only talked about this camera from the perspective of an astronomer in the daytime it's just as amazing to use it can really do whatever you want in terms of videography this is definitely the best astro vlogging camera made so far and from the perspective of an astronomer and an extreme low light videographer there's really no competition out there the biggest competition for the a7s3 in this regard is the a7s2 and after that is the original a7s this camera really is in a league of its own when it comes to filming the stars now boy am i excited to get out there and film some vlogs so make sure to hit subscribe if you haven't already and if you're going out to enjoy the night sky anytime soon i wish you good luck and clear skies